Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. I know many of y'all had made long trips to be here with us to celebrate this special rite of passage. It is my great honor to welcome you to Warren Alpert Medical School's 21st annual Ceremony of Commitment to Medicine. I'm your host, Liz Talaferro. I'm a fourth year med student here at AMS. And my first honor of the day is introducing Dean Jack Elias. Dr. Elias is the Senior Vice President for Health Affairs and the seventh Dean of Medicine and Biological Sciences at Brown. A preeminent physician scientist, he brings to his role decades of experience as a National Institutes of Health funded researcher, a clinician special, specializing in pulmonary medicine, and chair of the Department of Medicine at the Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Elias is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and served as president of the Association of American Physicians. In a professional career spanning more than 30 years, Dr. Elias has cared for patients with a wide variety of lung ailments and injuries and has conducted research on conditions including asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, pneumonia, pulmonary fibrosis, and the effects of smoking. His NIH-funded laboratory focuses on cell and molecular biology of lung injury and repair. He earned his bachelor's degree and MD at the University of Pennsylvania, served an internship at Tufts New England Medical Center, and completed residency in medicine and fellowships in both pulmonary and critical care medicine and allergy and clinical immunology at the University of Pennsylvania. Prior to those esteemed accomplishments, <laughs> Dean Elias graduated from Cheltenham High School in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Dean Elias is on the Wall of Fame at his high school, which also produced Hall of Fame baseball player Reggie Mr. October Jackson and <laughs> Grammy-winning jazz artist Michael Brecker and your very own Liz Talaferro. <laughs> so after this, I'll be asking how I can get on the Wall of Fame. For now, please welcome Dean Elias. Thank you very much, Liz. Let me get a little organized here. Thank you. Uh, I wish you all could see what I see. This is a tremendous fill, filled house uh, and a, a, just a wonderful, wonderful view. Uh, I really have the pleasure of welcoming everybody uh, to the Warren Alpert Medical School. As the dean of the medical school, I want to welcome the parents, the family members, the spouses, the significant others and friends to your loved one's white coat ceremony. A especially warm welcome to the class of 2023. Congratulations. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, this class is the largest class in the history of Brown University and the Warren Alpert Medical School. It has 144 students. It is impressively diverse in terms uh, of ethnicity, uh, geography, and many, many other parameters. This group hails from 32 states and the District of Columbia and a variety of other countries by birth or citizenship, including Bolivia, Cambodia, Finland, Iran, and Vietnam. Some of you graduated just a number of months ago from Brown University. Others are here pursuing their second career. In your young lives, you have already published research, worked for the Global Health Fund, owned businesses, served our country, and many of you, unlike your dean, are former athletes. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, what you, but wherever you've come from, you are now entering, in my opinion, and I'm sure the opinion of everybody uh, in the front rows, you're entering the best profession in the world. Today, I'm not gonna place the white coat on you. Dr. Tunkel will be placing the white coat on you. Uh, but we will be welcoming you with that gesture into the world of medicine. I need to remind you that this is both a privilege and a great responsibility. You will have the privilege of being a trusted advisor in the lives of your patients. You will hold their secrets, and you will be with them on momentous occasions, both good and bad, in their lives. 
You will have the grave responsibility toward them of committing to keeping them safe, to making them well, and to always putting their welfare first, even in front of your own welfare. You will have days with impressive successes, and you will understand why you chose medicine as a career. You're also going to have days of frank failure. In both cases, you have to commit yourself to always striving to do better. You have to commit yourself from this day forward to being a lifelong learner. Now, one of the really nice things about being up here on the podium in front of the students is I have undivided attention. Most cell phones are on vibrate, at least. Uh, and, and I get to try to make four important points that I think students need to absorb at this early point in their career. Point number one, find your passion. You're going to have immensely wide-ranging experiences over the next four years. You need to participate in every one of them with massive gusto. Put everything you've got into it, because over the next four years, you have to find your niche. You have to find in the complex world of medicine where you belong, where you are going to make your contributions going forward. You have to get to a point where when you wake up in the morning and you come downstairs and you realize that you're about to walk out and do X, whatever X is for eight, 10, 12 hours, it ought to put a smile on your face. If it puts a smile on your face, you've used your time in medical school wisely and you've figured out where you belong and how you're going to be contributing going forward. Point number two, listen to your patients. They have a story to tell you. They have a life history to share with you. And they are your partners in the entire endeavor. Point number three, commit yourself to advancing knowledge. It is your responsibility to ensure that the next generation of physicians has new and more effective ways of treating patients than we do now. I vividly recall being a medical student in the laboratory of Dr. Peter Knoll. Uh, who was uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. <coughs> I was in the lab on the day that Dr. Knoll realized that if he looked at the chromosomes of people with chronic myelogenous leukemia, a small piece of one chromosome was now sticking to the wrong chromosome. We didn't know what it meant. We talked about it for a long, long time. And we didn't even know what to name it. And then finally, because it all happened in Philadelphia, they called it the Philadelphia chromosome. Easy, easy answer, call it the Philadelphia chromosome. But those of, who were in that room of my age got to watch us move from the Philadelphia chromosome to realizing that a new protein had been made by fusing two other proteins, which is now called the bcr abel translocation. We then got to realize that that new protein drove the leukemia cells to proliferate, which we had never understood before. And then somebody said, well, then we can block that protein. And a blocker of that protein was made. And that is the drug Gleevec that most of you will probably prescribe during the courses of your careers and not even know what the miracle is that took place behind it. But what it did is it took a disease that was a horrific disease and turned it into a disease that can largely be controlled with a pill. Think about that as a change in uh, events for everybody. Now, I'm not here telling anybody in this room that medicine is perfect. In fact, medicine is far from perfect. We need every one of you to keep your eyes open, keep your thinking caps on as you go through your careers, and find ways to improve medicine in the ways that fit into how you're interacting with your passion in the process. The fourth point that I want to make is that you need to accept the mantle of teacher and mentor. And I know first year medical school, first month or two of medical school, you're not feeling like you're teaching anything to anybody. You're absorbing as much as you possibly can. But it will not be very long before you will be in that position. Uh, and, and, and all I can say is take it to heart. Enjoy the idea of learning and enjoy the idea of then teaching the next generation and passing on uh, this new knowledge to the next generation. 
Let me close today by pointing out that today's white coat ceremony is in many ways a family day. You are here with your extended family, but you're joining another family. You're joining the Alpert Medical School family. During the next four years, please remember that the faculty and alumni who are all here uh, are committed to your growth, development, and success. Please accept their mentorship and guidance as the years progress and the challenges present themselves. Class of 2023, welcome to the Alpert Medical School and welcome to what we expect will be a tremendous, tremendous time in your life. Congratulations. Thank you, Dean Elias, for those remarks. I would like to share a few words with you that I hope will be helpful. First, I would like to thank my classmates. I'm extremely honored that y'all voted for me to be the white coat speaker. This is pretty cool. Um, and then obviously I have to shout out my family. So, hey, G-Ma, hey, Daddy, hey, Mama, hey, Timmy, hey, Josh, hey, Jerry. All right, here we go. During my first year of medical school, my middle brother Josh was a first year medical student as well. Somehow we began discussing Josh's dislike of his white coat. He shared that he was planning to wear his white coat as little as possible. He did not like the image it projected. He did not agree with the power dynamic it reinforced. I had been wrestling with the meaning of the white coat as well, but I rushed to defend it. I scolded my brother for not embracing the significance. It would be powerful for him to wear the white coat as a black man in the United States. I criticized the way he was dismissing the privilege we were being given. Moreover, it felt like he was discounting something that I had worked toward my whole life. A pediatrician is my consistent answer to that popular question, what do you want to be when you grow up? When my brother dismissed the white coat, I felt dismissed. Okay, now fast forward to fourth year. A few weekends ago, my roommate said she was going to wash her white coat. She asked if I wanted to add in mine. We like washing our white coats separate from our other clothes so we don't get hospital on our regular clothes. <laughs> my response, um, I have no idea where my white coat is. You can just go ahead. You're probably surprised, right? Liz Talaferro, defender of the white coat, had no idea where their white coat was. I know. It turns out that because I'm both a fourth year medical student and a future pediatrician, I rarely wear my white coat. The white coat cannot be the representation of me as a future physician if I do not wear it. So what does the white coat mean? Remember that original argument with my brother about the value of the white coat? I was right. It is extremely powerful that I get to inhabit the white coat as a black queer person. My brother was right. The white coat does not represent me as a future physician. To clarify this apparent contradiction, I offer a few thoughts. You will most likely come across two lies during medical school, the fallacy of isolation and the fallacy of powerlessness. Each one of you will experience them differently based upon your identities and your life narrative. I expect you will remember very little of this speech, so this is what I want you to grab. When you come up against these barriers, remember. You're not the only one, and it matters that you are here. The fallacy of isolation says that you are the only one experiencing what you are going through. Particularly for students of marginalized identities, this is a heavy burden. You may be the only one who holds your particular identities in many settings during medical school. For all students, this conclusion is dangerous. This conclusion suggests that no one could possibly understand what you're going through, so no one can help or that no one else shares your struggles, so your challenges must be your own fault. You may have already begun to feel this way during your first few months of medical school. The transition to first year is jam-packed with newness, a new community, new material, new everything. Whether it is the content itself or another aspect of your new life, you may feel that your experiences are unrelatable. You may feel like the only student actually struggling with biochem 
It may be hard for the community that you came from to understand what you are wrestling with now. Not to mention the fact that life does not pause just because your plate begins to fill up with medical school. Unfortunately, the process and culture of medical education can lend itself to this sense of isolation. Acknowledge those feelings when they come. Fight as hard as you can to do what makes you feel the most you, and do not do it alone. Medical school is a team sport, which includes classmates, family, friends, whoever your people are. You are not alone. You do not have to do this alone. I would say you cannot do this alone. Importantly, you did not get to this point alone. So, shout out break. For those whose community is not here, take a moment to think about the people who have walked with your journey thus far. For those whose community is here, find them, give a little wave, make some eye contact, recognize that they walked here too. This is their day as well. All right, yeah, okay. There, there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. All right, now, back to it. The second fallacy is the fallacy of powerlessness. This is the just a med student lie. It says you are just a medical student, so you do not have the power to make an impact, whether on medical education, individual patient care, or the healthcare system. Again, this is untrue. First, we have a responsibility to acknowledge the privilege and power of the white coat. For good and for bad, our society highly values what doctors and future doctors say and do. As Uncle Ben says, with great power comes great responsibility. Do not underestimate your capability now and in the future to shift individual encounters and systems. Secondly, do not be discouraged by the times when it feels like you are just training to become a better med student. It may feel that you cannot control what your training includes or what kind of physician you will become. For me, I have spent the last three and a half years wrestling with feelings of powerlessness in response to questions about racial equity in medical education and healthcare. This wrestling was brought into greater clarity recently when a community member asked a question of an attending physician at a conference. She, a black woman, asked how some medical students and residents could think black skin is different than white skin. She was referring to a study from 2016. This study found that some medical students and residents believe that black patients literally have thicker skin than white patients. She grew more distressed as she spoke. She questioned how the medical education system in this current time could still be producing physicians who viewed her differently because she was black. My answer, med students are often taught that being a particular race makes a person's body work differently. Race is often listed with disease risk factors like smoking or genetic mutations. This implies that this difference makes someone more or less likely to get sick. However, there is no gene that all black or Latinx or white people have. Race does not arise from biology. Race is simply a way of grouping people in society. I shared this woman's distress as a member of a community that is impacted by race-based thinking. Additionally, I shared her distress as part of the institution of medicine which contributes to race-based thinking. I agreed with this woman that the way that medical education and healthcare are structured harms people of color. This meant I was able to share the hope I have found in the midst of this revelation. This hope arises from a recognition of our power, even as med students. Every time we enter into a patient encounter, we have the chance to shift that patient's health narrative. By walking into the room, I change people's understandings of what a doctor looks like. Each time I call a pediatric patient doctor and offer them the chance to use my stethoscope, I chip away at the barrier between physician and patient. By taking the time to ask patients their story, I can shift the balance of what type of knowledge is valuable in medicine. A patient's knowledge of their lived reality is as valuable as our clinical knowledge. To shift someone's healthcare experience, on any scale is power. It matters when we do that. Now, I know for me, being told that I had the power to basically be kind to people felt like a consolation prize. I did not come to med school to simply be kind. I came to impact people's health. Plus, if our power lies in the way we treat patients, what does that mean for the first two years of medical school when we rarely interact with patients? We can address concerns in the clinical environment. 
However, the foundation is laid long before we begin our clinical rotations. The content that we learn as preclinical students directly impacts the type of physicians we will become. You have the power to shift that content. It may not be the type of power that you would like, but do not believe that you do not have the right and the power to influence what you learn. In addition to the content is the culture of medicine. You have the power and opportunity to shape what the field of medicine values. Medical education and healthcare will reflect your priorities starting now. Yes, it may seem far outside of our control in this era of standardized testing and board scores. I genuinely believe that at AMS and in medicine more broadly, it matters which knowledge we prioritize and which activities we pursue beyond the lecture hall. You have the power now to decide what will make you a good physician. That balance will be different from student to student. For everyone, studying is not the only thing that will matter. Medicine is not just about science. It is about humans. So be human. Explore your passions. Figure out what makes you angry or upset and work to address those issues. Figure out what makes you happy and do those activities as often as possible. We have the power to center all stages of medical education around what is best for all people. And that includes us and our classmates. Be open about your experience and mindful of the experiences of others. Ask for the support you need and figure out how to support others. Even on the hardest days, remember, you have the power to spend time on yourself. At some point, each of us will need reminding. At some point, each of us will be able to remind someone else. We are not alone, we have power. Ultimately, our white coats are an important symbol especially for those who are students of color, first gen, and or low income, there's great significance to wearing what was previously inaccessible to your people, whether by law or by circumstance. As you all accept your white coats today, remember, you define what the symbol of the white coat means. The white coat just lets people know that you and all your fabulosity are connected to medicine. It doesn't matter whether you're wearing your white coat or have not worn it in months. You are the real symbol of what healthcare is and what medicine can become. For those who interact with you, you determine what the white coat means. Thank you. Thank you, wow, I'm very touched. All right, so now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sachin Patel, who will deliver the Charles O. Cook, MD, Distinguished Visiting Lecture. Established in 1994 through a bequest from Mrs. Ruth Cook Peterson, this lecture was created to provide a lasting benefit to the Brown medical community. We are very grateful to Mrs. Peterson for her gift, and today we are honored to welcome Dr. Patel to the distinguished family of Charles O. Cook lecturers. Dr. Patel completed his urology residency here at the Alpert Medical School, followed by a fellowship in endourology, robotics, and minimally invasive surgery at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine. He practices urology in Chicago and is an adjunct clinical assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He wrote his first medical history paper while at Brown and continues to enjoy writing and teaching the history of medicine. He serves on the history committee of the William P. Didich Center for Urologic History and has been elected to the American Osler Society for his contributions to the history of medicine. Please welcome Dr. Patel. Good afternoon, Dean Elias, medical faculty, alumni, parents, guests, and the class of 2023. It is truly an honor to be here before you and to have the opportunity to speak to you at the 21st Annual Ceremony of Commitment to Medicine. When I was asked to give this lecture, I couldn't help but think back to my class's white coat ceremony in 2000, which was the second such ceremony. I remember feeling the same excitement you were feeling today of finally getting your very own white coat. At that time, our medical school was named the Brown University School of Medicine. We did not have our own building, 
and we're sharing space at the Biomed Center with the main administrative buildings still at Arnold Labs. I remember that one of the hot topics that we discussed at the Medical School Senate was how we could get a sign for the medical school, as we were worried no one quite knew where our medical school was located. <laughs> we could only dream that one day our medical school would have its own home and its own building. It's been wonderful to see how much the Warren Alpert Medical School has grown over those years. Now that you'll be getting your own white coats, I'm allowed to tell you a few secrets about the medical school. Though our medical school, school is relatively young, the first class graduated in 1975, it literally has roots that go back to the time of Hippocrates, some 2,000 years ago. When it was founded, Dean Stanley Aronson was given seeds from the tree on the island of Kos that Hippocrates, the father of medicine, taught under. The tree of Hippocrates is still there to this day. Dean Aronson planted those seeds and nurtured the sapling, much as he did our new medical school. And when it was large enough, the tree was planted outside of Arnold Labs on the Brown campus, where it still stands to this day. Though the practice of medicine has been around for millennia, the white coat is a recent symbol of the field. The white coat originated in scientific laboratories, and physicians started wearing white coats in the late 19th century as they incorporated scientific principles into the field of medicine and helped distinguish themselves from those that practiced quackery. As Joseph Lister's concepts of antisepsis took hold, the white coat came to further symbolize cleanliness, and thus both physicians and nurses dressed in white garb. Throughout your careers as future physicians, you will have many white coats, but your first one will always be special. The white coat has become a symbol of professionalism and the trust that you earn in the patient-physician relationship. You've heard this twice now already, but wearing the white coat is a privilege that comes with great responsibility. When you wear it, patients will confide in you intimate secrets that they would not tell their closest friends or family. Like a detective's badge, your white coat allows you to ask, examine, and investigate as you work to heal them. Your time taking care of patients will give you a great perspective on life. When you take care of the sick, you quickly realize how much you have to be thankful for and the simple things that we all take for granted. As you begin your foray into clinical medicine and begin to interact with patients, I'd like to tell you about a few lessons that I've learned about the art of observation from a physician and famous literary character. When we think about the art of observation and deductive reasoning, we are often reminded of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's famous character, Sherlock Holmes. What many do not realize is that Conan Doyle was a physician, and his character, Sherlock Holmes, was based on Dr. Joseph Bell, one of Doyle's professors during his time at the University of Edinburgh. Sir William Osler, a contemporary of Bell, also examined the importance and emphasized the importance of observation in his teaching, stating that the whole art of medicine is an observation. To educate the eye to see, the ear to hear, and the finger to feel takes time. However, I personally think that all that wisdom can be distilled into a quote by the philosopher and Yankees catcher Yogi Berra when he said, you can observe a lot by just watching. <laughs> Sir Arthur Conan Doyle in his autobiography wrote, I thought of my old teacher, Joe Bell, of his eagle face, of his curious ways, of his airy trick of spotting details. If he were a detective, he would surely reduce this fascinating but unorganized business to something nearer to an exact science. In one classic anecdote, a patient was brought into the amphitheater limping. Dr. Bell asked one of his students the cause. The student replied that he didn't know, as he hadn't asked the patient. The doctor replied, well, there's no need to ask him. You should see for yourself. He has injured his right knee. He is limping on that leg. He injured it by burning it in a fire. You see how his trouser is burnt away at the knee. This is Monday morning. Yesterday was fine. Saturday was wet and muddy. The man's trousers are muddy all over. He had a fall in the mud on Saturday night. Then turning to the patient, he said, you drew your wages Saturday, got drunk, and then trying to get your clothes dry by the fire when you got home, you fell on the fire and burned your knee. Isn't that so? Yes, sir, replied the amazed man. Conan Doyle would use similar anecdotes to serve as the basis for one of Holmes' examples of the method. As a professor and teacher, Joseph Bell trained his amateur Watsons in the habits of, of, of observation. Bell would insist his students try his methods, but that these deductions should then be confirmed by absolute and concrete evidence. Now, I do not recommend that, like Dr. Bell, you should diagnose your patients before doing a history and physical. <laughs> However, there is a lot you can learn by using all of your senses. Challenge yourself to see how much information you can discern about a patient as you walk in to meet them. Though your clinical skills will improve over the next four years, learn to pay attention to the nonverbal communication eye contact, gestures, tone of voice. 
Your ability to read a, a patient's body language and mood can directly impact your interaction with a patient and can help you put a patient at ease, build rapport, and effectively communicate. If you have an upset patient, you'll want to try and determine the cause and diffuse the situation before moving on. If you forge ahead without noticing, you can sometimes make a situation worse. Be mindful of your patient's perspective. And sometimes, the patient won't directly tell you what is bothering her or him, or you may feel that something is missing. It is your job, like a detective, to pick up on the clues to help make the diagnosis. But no matter what your observations are, you must always verify them with evidence. One of my favorite stories about Dr. Bell is the story of the man with the puffed up cheeks. Bell observed a bedridden man and said, you're a bandsman. Aye, sir, replied the sick man. I'd just like to point out that Dr. Bell would have clearly failed his undoctoring course in OSCE at Brown <laughs> as he did not begin his patient interaction with an open-ended question. <laughs> However, after his examination, the confident Dr. Bell told his students, you see, gentlemen, I am right. This man has paralysis of his cheek muscles the result of too much blowing at wind instruments. All we need to do now is confirm our theory. Then turning to the patient, he asked, what instrument do you play, my man? The big drum, came the reply. <laughs> to his credit, Dr. Bell would be the first to tell you that he was wrong on quite a few occasions. And you will be too throughout your careers in medicine. Ours is a humbling profession. And Bell was fond of saying, observe carefully, to do shrewdly, and confirm with evidence. Though we have talked about Dr. Bell, and by, extending, by extension, Sherlock Holmes, and extolled the virtues of the art of observation, I have always felt that Sherlock Holmes by himself would not make the best physician. Yes, he was brilliant, excellent at the art of observation and deduction, and in the novels, he was always right. But medicine requires more than just always being right, and we treat patients, not robots or machines. In Conan Doyle's novels, we sometimes forget Watson's contribution. It was no coincidence that Watson was a physician. He was intelligent and curious. He was flexible and open-minded. He was personable, patient, and he was a loyal and reliable friend. He was the perfect foil for Holmes, and together they struck a great balance. So as you train to become brilliant like Sherlock Holmes, remember not to neglect your Watson. Lastly, I would like to ask each of you to find time for yourself. Doctors are selfless by nature and will prioritize their patients before themselves. In the coming years, there will be no shortage of patients for you to see. Find regular pockets of time to continue to still do whatever activity makes you happy, whether it be spending time with friends and ham family, playing music, playing a sport, painting, illustrating, or writing. Make time for yourself, and this will allow you to recharge. It will make you a better person and a better physician. As you don your white coats for the first time, we welcome you into the Brown Medical family as clinicians in training. You are following the footsteps of many millennia of physicians. Osler once said, the practice of medicine is an art, not a trade, a calling, not a business, a calling in which your heart will be exercised equally with your head. Work hard, take care of yourself, and remember to hone your skills in observation so that you can become both a combination of Holmes and Watson. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patil. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Pritha Vasavia president of the Brown Medical Alumni Association. Dr. Basavia remains deeply engaged with Brown by interviewing and coaching students, hosting Brown events in her community, serving on the corporation, and serving on the BMAA since 2010. She is assistant dean of pre-clerkship education and clinical professor at Stanford School of Medicine. After earning her MD, Dr. Basavia served as a primary care chief resident for Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center at the West Roxbury VA and inaugural fellow in medical education at Harvard. She was one of the first hospitalists and the youngest firm chief at Beth Israel. Before joining Stanford in 2006, she served as a medicine attending and in educational leadership roles at Harvard and UC San Francisco. Dr. Basavia has received a humanism award from Harvard 
National and Regional Society of General Internal Medicine Educator of the Year Awards and distinctions for exceptional teaching and mentoring. Please welcome Dr. Basavia, who will lead us through this momentous occasion. I'm following in very big and important footsteps, having heard from all the people who have preceded me. So thank you to all of you for inspiring us already. So a huge welcome and congratulations to the Brown class of 2023 on this momentous transition to medical school. As the current president for the Brown Medical Alumni Association, also known as the BMAA, it's my unique honor to be able to participate in this white coat ceremony. We have sponsored the white coats and some surprises that you may find in your pockets. Mm -hmm. And as you've heard, the white coat may be a symbol or a privilege. It is the symbol that you define in your journey of medicine. And I want to warmly welcome you as our newest members to be in the alumni community. So you're probably asking, well, what can we do together as an alumni community? Well, we connect with you on a variety of networking events like this morning's speed coaching. We also do community outreach. For example, when people come to interview out in the Bay Area, you can house with me and you can house with other alumni when you're going to different interviews coach, mentor, sponsor study breaks, do fundraising for an really interesting activities, seed grants for some wonderful research projects that we hear about that all of you are incredibly talented in doing. And we love to support the pursuits of the medical school and for Dean Elias and his amazing team. I like to think that it wasn't that long ago when I was in your seats as students, um, and I can still feel today the palpable energy. My three daughters tell me it was actually a long time ago. And in the upcoming uh, re medical reunion of this May, it'll actually be my 25th. So that is a way of saying that, no, I'm not that old, but <laughs> how committed each of us you know, really will be over this long journey and the relationships we develop really to, truly endure over a lifetime and the relationships here and the friendships that you have will continue. So I hope that we have shown that to you today, that these endure. So I'd like to take a moment, as was mentioned before, it takes a village, a team sport, and whatever other metaphor you want to say for us to get here. So to the family, friends, staff, faculty, and to each of you with your incredible talents, dedication, and vision, I just wanna take a moment to give a big shout out and applause. So I'll end, Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. And I know that each of you, through your talents, advocacy, humanism, will give immensely, transform lives, be impactful, and perhaps even be on your own wall of fame. <laughs> and so with that, on with the celebrations. When your name is called, you will meet Dean Hunkel, shake hands and receive your white coat, and then I will go on to the next name. And I know there's a lot of wonderful energy and applause waiting in the room. I just kindly ask if you could wait till everyone gets their white coat so that we can give a big shout out together. Ready? All right. Casey Abrams. I know, that was a test. <laughs> Tatiana Abrantes. Lydia Adamuwagun.
Gazal Agagoli. Chikata Apenyo. Anthony Arcis. Kobe Axelrod. Swecha Bantkota. Robert Barno. Brooke Barrow. Catherine Barry. Nicole Bensi. <laughs> Jacob Berman. <laughs> Amy Blackburn. Christopher Blanding Pothesen. John Bowler. Peter Broder. Dorothy Buning. Yes! Can Cow. Gregory Cavanaugh. Tess Sersansky. Edward Chen. Kevin Chen. Jocelyn Chang. Isabel Chin. Madeline Chin. Daniel Cho. <laughs> Jihei Choi. <laughs> Carlin Chuck. Asia Clayton. Yeah. 
Gregory Cohan. Natalie Correa. <laughs> Natalie Cortinas. John Katoya. Olivia Cummings. <laughs> Jonathan Daniel. <laughs> Vishnu Dantu. Spencer Darvo. <laughs> William Doak. <laughs> Dominique Dockery. Megan Duckworth. <laughs> Ogechi Ezema. <laughs> Audra Fain. Anthony Formicola. <laughs> Tia Forsman. <laughs> Jordan Fox. Adam Friedberg. <laughs> Tess Gabert. <laughs> Benjamin Guyo Marin. Geronimo Garcia, Jr. Yeah. Orlando Garcia. Yeah. Stephen Garden. Georgina Gimpaolo. <laughs> Lily Gordon. <laughs> Casey Halsey. Tyler Harder. Zandra Ho.
Katherine Hobbs. Mark Hosevar. Ryan Hoops. Kelsey Hopkins. Winston Jang. John Johnson. Keir Johnson. Leah Jones. Isabel Josephs. Gabrielle Jude. Sarah Kalen. Layla Kazemi. Brendan Kelly. Sophia Kerman. Nicole Kim. Lee Kinney. Grace Claris. Emma Kanapka. <laughs> Olivia Kozel. <laughs> Cicely Craybill. Michael Kwok. <laughs> Katya Levine. Alexis Hope Lerner. Julia Lerner. Lambert Lee. Aaron Licht. Erica Lynn. Jane Lindahl.
David Loftus. Christopher Lowe. Sokan Vichet Long. Daniel McLaughlin. Dylan Markey. Winston McCormick. Allison McHale. Giancarlo Medina Perez. Nandi Meta. Jordan Meltzer. Sam Mickle. David Miller. <laughs> Catherine Nicole Mozinski. <laughs> James Mullen. Dana Nikolic. Madhu Nori. Sarah Nuss. Rocio Oliva. <laughs> Matias Page. <laughs> Marcelo Paiva. Marina Palumbo. Sudisha Pereira. Dana Fang. Ronald Phillips. Yeah. Yuri Pierre Louis. Yeah. Yeah. 
Moriko Pinto. Mauricio. <laughs> Margaret Pixley. <laughs> Rafaela Posner. Praveen Raja Guru. Shreya Ramaya. Abigail Rayner. Neha Reddy. Nathaniel Rex. Gabriella Santarik. Victoria Schulte. <laughs> Naomi Shambo. <laughs> Blessed Sharif. Sylvian Sherman. Luke Solomon. Sophia Song. Jonathan Spiegel. <laughs> Praveen Srinivasan. <laughs> Michael Stevens. Olivia Stone. <laughs> Daniel Strauss. <laughs> Luke Sullivan. Johanna Suskin. <laughs> Michael Taglienti. <laughs> Oliver Tang. Anastasia Tillman.
Lin Chan. Nyla Tucker. Adrian Turku. David Ween. Alexandra Wong. Joseph Wu. Daniel Yang. Catherine Zavin. Raina Zhang. <laughs> Brian Zhao. <laughs> Brian Zhang. Congratulations, MD Class of How y'all feeling? How y'all feeling? Kind of cool, right? Right? Enjoy that cool. This journey has already begun long before today. I think hopefully you have some renewed energy. I hear they threw y'all an Oski or something next week. Come on, man. But no, this is really exciting. So again, congratulations to you. Thank you so much to everyone who came to celebrate this with us today. Just a few announcements. So all students and their guests are now invited to attend a reception at the medical school. We'll have shuttle service to and from the church, um, from the front of the church to the medical school, and they'll run till 730. Um, and last but not least, we're going to give MD 2023 a chance to stand, celebrate themselves, celebrate their family, and let it all out. You remember you were holding it all in? When everyone was like, okay, stand up and do it. Do it. All right, remember this feeling the best you can, and now you're free to go. Thank you for coming. It was great to see everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs>